Today we're going to be making one of my all-time favorites, bone-in, skin-on barbecue chicken thighs uh, with a top-secret recipe vinegar sauce, which I'm going to show you so it's not going to be such a top-secret anymore, I suppose. Anyhow, if you don't want to make it, just go to the store and get yourself some of the Chevettas. That's one of my favorite off-the-store, off-the-store, off-the-shelf-in-the-store brand uh, vinegar-based barbecue sauces. You have to be a little careful with it, though. It's wicked potent. So if you marinate your chicken in it and you think, well, I'll just throw it in the fridge overnight, you're going to have to throw the chicken away because it's going to be awful. Just putting that out there. Ask me how I know. So we're going to make our own homemade stuff. We're going to start out with some of the apple cider vinegar. I don't think it really matters which brand you use. I've used 100 different brands and they all kind of taste the same to me. Uh, about 24 ounces of that, about three quarters of a quart. And then to spice that up a little because apple cider vinegar, vinegar does tend to be kind of weak, I dump in a little bit of distilled vinegar, just plain old, plain old vinegar, the kind your wife uses to clean everything with. At least that's what mine does. 12 ounces of that. Oh gosh, after we put that in there, then we switch over and put in a little bit of the poultry seasoning. Now I like to use four big old tablespoons. Now this poultry seasoning that we used was just something that we picked up today, Southern Blend. I don't even know what that means, but it's got a little bit of down south in it. Or you can just use regular old poultry seasoning, but I like to switch it up once in a while. After that, a little bit of seasoned salt, some Lawry's, I guess is what we had. Four big old tablespoons of that, and then some black pepper. Uh, you can grind your own or cheat and get it out of a can like I do, and uh, four teaspoons of that. So once that's in there, you need to get out the Worcestershire Shire sauce, or however you say it. Uh, I take some of that stuff there, about a half a cup, and you dump that in, and about a half a cup of oil. I just use regular old whatever Vanessa has in the cupboard, oil, and that's it. Then you get the smallest whisk you can find in the drawer, and you stir it all up, and just mix it together. Now, you can see I'm mixing it in my uh, plastic tote, because that's what I'm gonna marinate the chicken in, and I like to dirty less dishes for my wife, because I care about her. After that, you get her all mixed up. You can take some of it at that time and set it to the side in case you want to marinade, in case you want to marinate, in case you want to baste some of your chicken while you're cooking it. You can use the salmonella sauce, providing that you're gonna, you know, cook it off. But if you want to put some on it when it's done, you probably shouldn't use what you've marinated in. Cross-contamination, they call it. People get all weird about it. Anyhow. I just take my chickens after that, stack them all up in there, and I'm going to let these sit for an hour or two, and then we're going to go and get the pit barrel uh, cranking, uh, just some Kingsford briquettes, and get to cooking. It's raining now. Go figure. I was going to start the grill, so we come in to see what you're cooking for your sides. What do you got? Some classic salt potatoes. Yeah, enough salt to kill you. They won't kill you. That's a myth. <laughs> That's a myth. Okay. So I think I think salt potatoes now basically they're just potatoes boiled in an extremely high concentrated salt. I believe they're regional. Did you know that, Miss Zoe? I don't think this is all throughout the whole United States that people oh, love people and enjoy salt the salt potato. Yeah. Oh well, here's the recipe. You have potatoes and an, um, giant a salt. giant amount of salt. And that's pretty much it. What but I that? do I a do cup believe of salt probably. Yeah, probably a cup. But I do yeah. believe that's that's regional to our area. Huh. I think. Could be wrong. Hmm. I'll look it up. Okay. I'm just here to make sure you didn't skimp. Oh, I'm not skimping. I'm making your favorite salad. The spinach strawberry salad. Yes. Slash feta. Where? Slash sliced almond slash poppy seed dressing. What? And you're missing something. Oh, sliced almonds. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna slice up some strawberries. First you haul them, then you slice them thinly. I guess it doesn't, you do this any way you want. This is how I do it. lettuce in the dish. Slash spinach. Or spinach, yes. It is green. I like to do like two layers so it's all dispersed well. Oh, okay. Good tip. And then put the strawberries in there. 
This is like one of my favorite salads. And then the feta. Feta. I like to use the fat free because you we had the full fat one once and you thought it was too strong. So oh. I would I always get this for this salad. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then what you got there? I got some sliced almonds. Whoa. Whoa. Got the poppy seed dressing. And then you do it again. not a big salad guy but this is hands down my favorite salad of all times I, I couldn't even dare guess how many times I ate this salad I don't really get sick of it it's very good it keeps kind of okay with yeah. like three days probably okay. tops which is enough to eat it and it goes great with chicken it's good in the summertime but yeah if you're gonna make it and you plan on keeping it for a long time it does kind of start to get a little bit slimy after I don't recommend cutting the spinach if you're going to keep it because then it really loses its crunchiness. It becomes really slimy then. Oh, okay. Good mm -hmm. tip. Yeah. But otherwise, like this, what did you say, about three days, right, in the fridge? Yeah. Yep. And after that, it just starts to get a little slimy. Mm -hmm. So, still edible, but just uh, if you're a texture person, then no beans. Hopefully the thunderstorms are gone for a little while now. Uh, and now that we have the sides uh, going on in there, Mrs. O does, we'll uh, get the pit barrel repping here. So we use these tumbleweeds. These things are great for starting charcoal. I just throw one on the ground. We use the chimney, throw some Kingford briquettes in there, get them babies ripping. They take probably 20 minutes or so. And then we fill up the bin that goes in the pit barrel. We're gonna need to go get another bag, I guess. Why did I just use gloves putting that in when it's not even hot? Because it's messy. Uh, the seasoning that builds up in the barrel and pretty much all over everything is pretty black and gooey and sticky and gets all over. It's pretty hard to wash off, but our chimney is just about done. Let's get that dumped in there. I'll give you one more free tip Friday. So before we dump that in, if you're doing an all day cook, or not an all day, but you know, something more than what we're doing, you got the vent hole over here. Dump your hot coals over here because I find that it tends, if you dump more majority of them over here, it tends to burn super hot. It doesn't burn the whole basket. If I dump them over here, they work their way towards the oxygen and it seems to get a better burn. Anyhow, enough talking. It's starting to rain, so we want to dump these in. Uh, for us, it doesn't really matter, so we're just going for a, a random dump. And then I'm going to throw the lid on it so it doesn't get all wet. Wait for this storm to pass, and then let's get ripping. Generally, if I'm doing like ribs or brisket, pork butt, or something that takes, you know, several hours uh, to cook, I usually wouldn't leave the bars out or the lid cracked or anything to, you know, promote the starting of the fire so to speak, I would dump the chimney and then I just start cooking right after that, lid on, bars in, you know, low and slow, let it go. Uh, when I do the chicken, I find it works best that if we can kind of get the pit temperature up, get her pretty hot to start out with, so when we stick them on that grate, you get a little bit of a sizzle. And then let them go for a little bit until they brown up on the bottom, we're going to flip them over on the skin side at that point. 
let them get just about cooked and at that point I take the lid right off and we use the pit barrel as a regular grill to finish off the chicken that way it's not rubbery on the outside the skin will get nice and crispy and it just gives it some really great flavor and to be honest if it wasn't raining right now the lid would be fully off it because it gets ripping a little bit faster well the rain's coming and we can't wait so Like I said, I do it initially just skin side up. It, it probably doesn't matter, but The pit barrel works great in the rain. So we're just rounding about the 45 minute mark. We want to have a little peek here. Just want to make sure they're not getting away from us is all. And, which I don't think they are. Just starting to get a little bit of color on the bottom of them. And just kind of take a poke around at a few of them. Make sure you don't have any real hot spots. If you do, we can just rotate the grate here. Easy enough to do and it's giving a little spin just to be on the safe side. We do have some smaller pieces in here that are gonna cook way faster. Yeah, we're gonna give that some more time. I find that if you have a ton of chicken on here, or a ton of food in general, as it's dripping down into the pit, if you will, it does tend to cool it down and, and cook slower. Uh, for example, if you're cooking like three or four half chickens on here, they cook way faster than if you're cooking 17 or 18. So uh, just keep that in mind if you're new to a pit barrel. Breaking the clouds at about the one hour mark. We're gonna, we're gonna flip them. So we're just gonna move the rebar out of our way. They should have some good color at this point. If you finish them in the pit barrel, I think we've talked about this, they tend to stay kind of rubbery. We like a crispy skin, so we're gonna flip them here. I'm gonna leave the rebar out. We're gonna kind of start the process of getting this thing cranking. I'm gonna put some of these fatter ones in the middle, move some of the smaller ones here to the outside. It's amazing how much they cook down in the end. I like to crowd them a little bit because we're going to spread some seminella sauce on them. That's some of the sauce that's, that we marinated them in. It's about the last time you can actually use that without worrying about it. Let me go grab that for us. Give it a good mix up here. Get out the old mop. That right, should be enough. I'll go take the rest of it and dump it out somewhere. I'm gonna leave the rebars out at this point because like I say I want the temperature to start coming up and this is at the point you don't uh, you don't really want to walk away because it can get out of control pretty quick but our next move uh, when we open it up again we're gonna move that grate up and really let it get ripping so if you've never used your pit barrel as a grill, but you've done a ton of, of cooking with it conventionally, you know, hanging the meter like this with stuff sitting on the grate on the inside, and you have a bunch of grease in the bottom of it, you have to be pretty careful using it as a grill for the first time because that grease can lighten. You can get a pretty nasty grease fire going 
uh, you know, some flames coming out of the top, it's not a big deal because you just, you know, you throw the lid on it and it snuffs it out. But just kind of be warned uh, about that. And that's it. And then I just wash these off because we're using them for raw chicken. Next time we're going to be flipping them, they're going to be pretty well cooked. And we're just going to want to get them crisped up. Don't walk away from it when the rods are out of it, though. About 20 minutes into what we just did there. I want to have a peek. We're probably going to move that rack up. It sounds like they're sizzling pretty good. And I don't want it to get out of control here. I'm trying to do it without dumping all the chicken off it. Oh, come on, baby. We're just lifting that right up to the top, so not a big deal. I want to have a peek at these. Make sure it's not getting out of control. Shouldn't be. All right, looks good. We got some good color on them. Of course, it's starting to rain. So we're going to let this keep going, but this fire is going to get real hot real fast. So grab a beer and stand by. We have both the official uh, taste testers here waiting for the chicken to be done. How oh, Weston, are you waiting for some chicken? What about you, Wolf? Huh? I think she just wants to take a nap, to be honest with you. You just don't want it getting away from you folks. Uh, and and I, I guess I'll mention uh, the fact that using the pit barrel as a, a conventional grill, if you will, it does work pretty well. In my experience, I really love using it like this. It does use a pretty large amount of fuel if you're just doing, you know, a couple hamburgers or a couple hot dogs, you know, something like that. And that's why I think I'm going to get another, uh, a different grill, you know, maybe a, you know, Weber, or an egg or something like that, just for doing, if you want to do a couple steaks or, you know, like say just some burgers or something like that. For doing something like this where you're doing a whole bunch of chicken or, you know, chicken halves and, and stuff like that, it seems to work quite well. So that's just my limited experience, you know, using it like this. Is it done yet? It's almost done, Mrs. O. We're getting ready for the last flip. Mm. The skin side, skin mm. crisper, I call it. Smells good. It does smell pretty delish, doesn't it? How's our uh, salt potatoes there? They gotta be done. Yeah, I left them in the water so they stay hot. Oh, oh, I did look. That is regional to our area. Syracuse, New York, actually. Home huh. of the salt potato. I thought it was regional to, to our area. You know, growing up we always went to the state fair. We always got salt potatoes at state fair, which is in Syracuse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would be curious down in the comment section if people from all around non-New York areas have heard of and or eat the salt potato. If you haven't, you should try it. It's nothing really that special. It's not a, you know, a, I don't know what a to rare say. Delicacy. Yeah, it's not like this <laughs> delicacy, I guess, if you will. It's mm -hmm. just a really, really freaking salty potato. There's <laughs> <laughs> really no other way to put it. I mean, if I had to describe it, it's just a really salty potato. Yep. And who doesn't love salt? And they're typically served 
in a pool of butter. I guess if you were to go to a chicken barbecue in New York or to the state fair, you're gonna get your salt potatoes in a in a bat bat of butter. Yeah. So if the salt don't kill you, the butter will. But right. The potatoes are good. For yeah, you. the potatoes are good for you. I think I don't know. They're a nightshade vegetable, right? Isn't that bad? Depends on who you ask. It depends on what autoimmune disease you have. Isn't that an inflammatory or something? I don't know. I just eat them anyways. You want to try one? Sure. This little tiny sucker. Must have came off a of baby chicken. <laughs> so there's what, one. Here's what she looks like. There you go. Oh, you want? Oh, careful. Wow. Watch your plate. Things are starting to get hot here, Miss Bill. Yeah. There's a couple little ones, but that was the smallest one. I think I done way early. That's good. It's, uh... It, remember, it's that different uh, poultry season, some kind of southern stuff or something there. Yeah. I really like it more. Oh, really? Is it pretty good? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We got it at the Wegmans. I don't know if you guys have a Wegmans for your ad, or maybe you can Google that brand we showed. So you watch the skin, it'll start getting these little blisters on it. That's when it's starting to get real crispy. And it will go from great to really bad really quick. So you kind of got to keep an eye on it. But the chicken thighs are quite fatty. They don't get dried out like the breast? No. Not typically. But I like it when it starts blistering up there. That's usually how you know it's quite crispy. I don't want it to get burnt. But as I see them getting done, I'm going to start flipping them. And we'll just finish them off on the meat side, or on the non-skin side, rather. You get it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So just a few more minutes like this, folks. We'll throw it in the bin and we'll take it inside. If you saved a little bit of your sauce in the beginning, once you put it in your bin, just sprinkle a little bit on there and that's it. Get after it. A little bit. That's good. Let's go. Eat some food. I guess we could stick the grate back in there. Uh, stick it on upside down so the handles are facing down. And then you can put the lid back on it. You can leave the rebar out. It, it'll cook hotter than usual and it kind of burns off some of that grease without the risk of it, you know, going up in flames. So that's usually how I end it. So Mr. O is gonna show you how you would typically receive the New York salt potato. So usually they'll come in a little bowl, swamped in butter and that's pretty well it. They're extremely salty as they are, so you don't really need anything else with them. Unless maybe you want some pepper. Yeah, you can put a little pepper with them, but that's how you would receive, you know, your classic salt potato. Oh. Then we get some of the strawberry salad, spinach. What, what would you call it? Strawberry, spinach, spinach, strawberry salad. Okay, spinach. I didn't know if it had an official name. I think that's all. So it's a spinach strawberry salad. Well, that's a big one. Yes, ma'am. Alright. And that's lunch slash dinner for us for the next two or three days, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least till we're sick of it. Mm -hmm. Which is about two or three days. Till it's gone. You have to eat till it's gone. Even if you are sick of it. So that's it folks. Uh Miss O is gonna finish plating up for us and the one child that's with us today. And that's it. Try out the recipe. 
if you're interested in getting a pit barrel, I do put links below. Uh, you can buy them off their website. I actually seen them on Amazon. I don't know if the price is the same. I didn't look. The pit barrel I'm using is a PBX. It's a 22 and a half inch. It's the bigger one. It has three rebars going through it instead of two. Uh, how many chicken halves are we doing at? 17? Uh, 17 or 18? Yeah. We did about 17 or 18 chicken halves at one time, hanging, you know, so it filled the rack. So that was quite a bit, this little party we had. And that worked out good because we did a couple rounds of those. You can do four or five, you know, six to eight pound pork butts at a time. You can do an entire turkey. Uh, you can fit a lot in that sucker. It's 22 and a half inch. And then you can also buy any type of 22 and a half inch grill accessories as far as, you know, the grate goes in there if you want a half grate. So like we did in our other video where we were doing a pork butt and we had three full racks of ribs hanging. It was pretty helpful for that. So. Anyhow, that's it. It's dinner time, so we'll see you guys later.